Please join me in welcoming to the stage John, Chris, and Mark. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you for braving the weather tonight. Actually, as you may know from your program notes uh, when you signed up for this program, Emily Ramshaw was supposed to be uh, the moderator for tonight's conversation, but she got a case of COVID. So she sends her best, and I am her sub. And I'm glad to be her sub because these are two gentlemen uh, who are friends and for whom I have high regard and have written wonderful books, as Mark said, John Avalon's Lincoln and the Fight for Peace and Chris Whipple's uh, Joe Biden and the Fight of His Life Inside Joe Biden's White House. So you've both written about fights, uh, the fight of the 16th president around peace after the Civil War, the fight of the 46th president uh, after the very chaotic uh, Trump presidency. Uh, actually, Joe Biden just tied this together in his State of the Union when he said, two years ago, our democracy faced the greatest threat since the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So John, let's talk about Lincoln's fight. What was Lincoln's fight for peace in the wake of the Civil War? Well, what Lincoln um, was confronting was a, a problem without precedent, not only in, in American history, but you know, really in human history, there'd never been a civil war on that scale before. And so Lincoln didn't have any precedents to draw on, and here he's the leader of an upstart third party. He's never held executive office, never held military office. Um, and yet he understands in a very deep way that you don't win the war unless you win the peace. And that's particularly true in a civil war, right? You can't, you know, salt the fields, uh, you, you know, you, you've got to find a way to live together again. And so even in the middle of the war, in the darkest days of the war, he's thinking proactively about how we can reconcile, how we can reunite. And, and that just takes a greatness of spirit as well as a wise leadership uh, that was not appreciated by everyone in his time, but I think justly has, has led him to be regarded as our greatest president. So Chris, uh, Joe Biden had reconciliation and reuniting very much on his mind when he took the presidency in 2021, characterized the situation that Joe Biden inherited as he took the presidency in 2021. Well, first of all, before I answer that, let me just say that what an honor it is to be here at the LBJ Library. Yes. Uh, John Avalon's written a terrific book. I, ju I just finished it. I recommend that everybody get it. And by, and by the way, I've been encouraged by the, the Biden White House to make as many comparisons as possible <laughs> between Lincoln and Biden tonight. Um, so <clears throat> the, when people ask me why I wanted to write this book, and my answer is, how could I not? I mean, Joe Biden and his team came into office facing the most daunting challenges since FDR's time. Uh, a once in a century pandemic, a crippled economy, racial injustice, uh, global warming, and of course the aftermath of a bloody attempted insurrection. And um, so it's, it's, it, it really seems to me that this, this is the fight of Joe. I mean, you could say about Biden that his whole life has been a fight against adversity, tragedy, bad luck. He lost his uh, wife and infant daughter in a car crash. He lost his son, Bo, to a brain tumor. Uh, he lost two attempts to uh, become the presidential nominee. His father always said, get up, and he did, and he won the presidency at last. Um, I was kidding about uh, Biden and Lincoln a second ago, but I actually think they have some things in common. Um, <clears throat> Great oratory is not one of them. <laughs> that, that, would be, that would be Lincoln. Um, but I do think that crises, they were both uniquely qualified to meet the moment when ex and extraordinary crises developed. In Lincoln's case, it's obvious. I think in Biden's case, we had an authoritarian president who refused to, uh, to, to give up power. Mm. Biden was perfectly positioned to, to rise to that challenge. And I think on February 24, 2022, 
when a Russian tyrant invite, invaded a democracy in the heart of Europe, no one was, I mean, Biden was uniquely qualified to meet that moment, and I think so far he has. And yet, John, yeah. you talked about Joe Biden as the, uh, here, here. Joe Biden has more experience than anyone who has ever held the Oval Office. Yeah. 36 years uh, as a senator, eight years as vice president. On the other hand, Abraham Lincoln had some of the, 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 the less experience than almost any president. Yeah. He was very unlikely to become our 16th mm -hmm. president. Yeah. And yet, just as Joe Biden is, seems to be meeting the moment, so too did Abraham Lincoln. Why? So um, they are very you know, different figures in, in exactly that, that regard. Um, you know, Lincoln had one term in Congress under his belt. That was it, um, and would have been regarded as a washed up politician. Um, and so I'd want to return the compliment because I just got through reading uh, your book. And the hardest thing to do is, is to sort of, and I try to do it all the time as a journalist, think about politics as history in the present tense. But to record an administration in real time with an eye towards history is, is a daunting task. Uh, I, I think in, in the case of, of Lincoln, um, and in, I think, as is in the case of all presidents, it comes down to character. You cannot emphasize that enough. I think the study of history is very clearly uh, a story about character. You know, that character is destiny um, eventually. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, certainly, it, it's not an unbroken string of, um, of successes. But, you know, in, in, and I think we forget how much a person's character, their personality ends up being reflected through in their policy, their principles, their policies, and, and their politics. And for Lincoln, um, you know, his, one of his superpowers is empathy, um, honesty, humor, which helps him communicate, and, and humility, by which I mean moral humility. And, and, and what he's really able to do politically is balance moderation with moral courage. And those two things rarely go together. But I think that's what's the nature of his uh, transformational leadership focused on reconciliation. And, and I think with Biden, you know, again, hardest thing in the world to do is, is, is view a, a current president through the eyes of history, although that's what we should try to do. But um, whatever you think of the, of the politics or the policies, um, character is a word. You know, I, 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 you know when it, Lincoln was widely hated in his time, too, so much so that his election resulted in secession. Um, but, but I always bring up, you know, L Lindsey Graham, who's, you know, somehow re-endorsed Donald Trump. Um, but, uh, you know, who, who famously said in, in somewhere around 2012 in a video, you know, he tears up and he talks about Joe Biden. He says, that's as good as man as God ever put on this green earth. And if someone who's worked with you in the Senate for several decades on the other side of political and partisan divide says that, that's called a character reference. Yeah, I, I was struck reading John's book. Um, he, he told the story of Lincoln visiting Richmond as mm. the Confederacy was collapsing. He'd be walking through the streets and he'd come across some bedraggled figure and spent an hour talking to that guy and making that guy feel heard. Um, that's Joe Biden. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, I was struck by that. Um, so, but I, I don't think that Lincoln had a chip on his shoulder quite the way Joe yeah. Biden does. Why right. um, well, so? Somebody, somebody said about Biden that, uh, this, you know, one of the things that, um, someone said about Biden is that he's, he's the only Irishman who doesn't carry grudges, which I, of which I can tell you is not true. Uh, Joe Biden is still pissed off with Averill Harriman, who was the FDR's famously patrician ambassador to the Soviet Union, a railroad magnate, who uh, had the temerity to summon young Joe Biden as a senator to his Georgetown study and interrogate him about foreign policy, Biden left furious. He's still pissed off. He says to, <laughs> he says to a good friend of his, hey, who is that? He can't remember his name, but he says, who is that guy? That rich, rich guy, the railroad guy, right? Um, so, and, and Biden also, I mean, something else I think that Lincoln and Biden had, had in common was that they were underestimated over and over and mm. over and over again. 
Uh, Biden has not forgiven those who underestimated him, uh, including a couple of Obama's senior advisors, uh, David Axelrod mm. and David Pluff, mm. as one of, um, because they evidently did not think he was presidential timber. And Biden confided to a friend of his, uh, uh, as a friend of his told me, he hates the Davids. <laughs> but what marks Joe Biden's character? Well, I think uh, he's a complex guy. Um, I think that, um, you know, he's, he's not a saint. He's not Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he, he does take names uh, of people who've crossed him. He has a temper. Uh, I wouldn't say, <clears throat> as was famously said about FDR, that he has a world-class temperament. Mm. Um, but having said all that, he, you know, he, he, he's, he knows what he wants. And I think that he spent, uh, again, decades uh, training for the crises that he's now facing. And um, that's made all the difference in the mm. case of Ukraine. I want to go back to something that Chris just referenced in your book. This is, the book begins just magnificently. On April 4th, 1865. And this illustrate that this very cinematic scene that you paint in the book so reflects Lincoln's character. John, if, talk about that scene. It's um, Lincoln in, in, in the fall of Richmond. Um, the opening sentence of the book is, uh, Abraham Lincoln walked into the burning Confederate capital uphill from the river, passing abandoned slave markets on his right, uh, holding his boy Tad's hand on, on his 12th birthday. And, 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 and just everything about that scene, the President of the United States walking into the abandoned and still aflame Confederate capital, not being greeted by a military escort, um, I mean, he's, he's just wandering basically into the wilds. There are six uh, Navy uh, you know, guys who'd act as oarsmen on a long boat. There's one admiral, one bodyguard, and his 12-year-old son. It happens to be Tad's 12th birthday. And he and Tad were incredibly tight, uh, particularly because he and Mary's marriage had been, was in rough shape. And they walk up not knowing where to find anybody. The city had barely been secured. It had been lit on fire by the Confederates as they were leaving. But they were just aiming visually for Thomas, the Thomas Jefferson designed state capitol on the top of the hill. And then he's recognized by some liberated slaves who, who come up to him uh, and fall at his feet. And he said, don't, don't kneel to me. You must kneel to God only. And it's captured by a, a few journalists who are on the scene, including this unbelievable uh, pioneering black war correspondent named Thomas Morris Chester. And you know, he, his path is being traced by sharpshooters. Um, it, it, is, it, it is one of the most cinematic scenes in American history, and yet it gets really short shrift, even in multi-volume biographies of Lincoln. But to me, all the major themes are there, and it culminates with Lincoln going to the Confederate capital, not an ounce of triumphalism about him, which is key to, I think, being a reconciling leader, and sitting in, in Jefferson Davis's chair. And, and, and there are all these moments um, in, in that day in Richmond but, but I think the one that most sums it up is uh, there's the, 20, the, the, the general who's in charge of securing the city at the time is a 29-year-old German immigrant named Godfrey Weitzel, who'd been overseeing the 25th Corps, which was an all-black uh, corps. Um, and, uh, and, and black Union soldiers were the ones really securing the city to a large degree. And Weitzel asks Lincoln at the end of the day, um, you know, how should I treat these former Confederates now under my command? And Lincoln says, if I were in your place, I'd let him up easy. Let him up easy. And um, that's just, that's very Lincoln. Your book, too, begins very dramatically, uh, Chris, with an unprecedented situation. Uh, Biden has to take the White House, taking over for an administration that is not participating in the transition. Set the scene for us. Yeah, it was, it was the most contentious and dangerous, and as it turned out, bloody uh, transition since the Civil War. Um, and, you know, oceans of ink have been written about the final days, Trump's final days. Uh, but I was really amazed to discover that nobody had really written about the inside story 
of, of how close it actually came to not happening, the transfer of power. I mean, it, it almost, it came down to an obscure Trump staffer, a deputy White House chief of staff named Chris Liddell, uh, who was born in, in uh, New Zealand, came to the US, uh, rose to become a CFO of General Motors and Microsoft, wound up in the Trump White House, didn't like Trump, thought that the office would change him. He was deluded by that. Uh, but he found himself there in the final days and he carried out this kind of sub rosa operation under Donald Trump's nose and without his knowledge, he made sure that the wheels of the transition kept turning. Uh, and he stayed out of the Oval Office so that Trump wouldn't know what he was up to. He had friends who would talk him off the ledge every time he was about to quit because of some outrageous thing Trump had said or done. Uh, they would say, wait a minute, you can't leave. Somebody's got to land this plane. And he stayed uh, until 11.59 a.m. on January 20th, uh, walked out into the West Wing parking lot, climbed into his... Uh, 1960 Corvette convertible, tipped his, tipped his fedora to the Secret Service agents and roared off down Constitution Avenue thinking we got, we, somehow we pulled it off. What the, would the peaceful have, transfer of power actually happened against all the odds. So what would have happened if Chris Liddell had not been in a position to help the Biden White House? Well, it's, 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 it's all too conceivable that, you know, Trump would have dug in, uh, the, 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 trans, the, the transfer of power would not have happened when, when it happened. Uh, you, you know, the most dangerous time in any transition, in this case, it wasn't necessarily January 6th, as, as frightening as that was, it's, it's, uh, it's January 20th, um, when there's the potential for, you, when you don't have the new team in place, and you have the old team there, Josh Bolton, uh, George W.'s chief of staff was worried about January 20th. Mm. What could happen? Um, so it was unbelievably fraught. And, and I'll just, to, to pay compliment, I mean, I think you really illustrate that shockingly undercovered inverse mm. mm -hmm. uh, well. And, and you know, I, I think it's difficult because we all lived through it in, in real time. Um, you know, you highlight some of these pivotal moments, McConnell coming out and saying, you know, no, th this is, this is going to move forward, that that stops the momentum. But as we've learned more and more information, not only, um, I mean, uh, the, the, this Fox Dominion lawsuit really exposing in real time uh, the lies that were being told that the people inside that organization knew were lies, um, to, uh, you know, the, 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 the QAnon people all expecting there'd be martial law and mass executions up until, you know, really noon on the 20th. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, there were a lot of thin reeds mm -hmm. that could have gone a very different, uh, a very different direction. And, and um, I mean, it, Joe Biden's transition team, which was run by his, his best friend and alter ego, Ted Kaufman, who, uh, who took Biden's Senate seat when Biden became Obama's vice president. Uh, Kaufman was in charge and Bob Bauer, the attorney, was the senior legal counsel. They had prepared for 70, 70 emergency contingencies that included Trump calling troops into the streets. Uh, they, they were, they, they stopped counting at 70. Um, they were, the, the, that's how. And, and I'll, I'll just add to that, remember, you know, the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, is fired after the election, in part to potentially create a more pliable situation in the Pentagon. Um, you know, these are details, you know, we, 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 we forget because there's so much uh, c coming down the pike, um, and, and you know, it, it really, it, it was close, and you get a, a you really show, um, you know, with I think new insight. Thanks. It's, well, it's, a, it's, it's yeah. an amazing story, and um, and Biden had a pretty extraordinary team in place to mm -hmm. to deal with it. It's astounding how a few people on the right side of history can make a profound difference, and this is an example of that. John, I want to go back to the Civil War for a second. Uh, clearly a very divided time in the course of this nation. Just master of understanding. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, we had uh, uh, do you see through lines between the divisions uh, after the Civil War and those that we are experiencing today? 
So after the Civil War is an interesting caveat. I mean, f first of all, <clears throat> I think part of the reason to study history, and I'm passionate about applied history, um, particularly the Civil War and the Reconstruction era, is to remember that we have been through far worse before. Right? That's important. <laughs> That's important to remember. Um, and, 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 but I think the lessons of Reconstruction, the period after the Civil War, uh, have their own unique gravity and, 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 and resonance. Um, first of which is to say that even, you know, winning a war and getting three constitutional amendments passed is not enough uh, to guarantee equal justice, equal justice under law, um, you know, for formerly enslaved Americans. You can't understand American history and American politics without understanding the role of race. Um, and, and, and understanding the massive resistance to multiracial democracy which has occurred periodically in our country. That is a very deep strain. And sometimes it's expressed in ways that seem disconnected. Um, some of the details I talk about in the book that are, I think, newly relevant. Um, I mean, the, the, the you know, voter intimidation, uh, violence, voter sub election subversion. Um, nobody really talks about uh, re redistricting in 1870, but it was absolutely a tool to disenfranchise newly enfranchised uh, blacks, but also retain more political power in the North. There was a move, uh, in the South, there was a move to gut public funding of integrated institutions uh, in that period. Um, not that the South didn't need a lot of public money to rebuild, mm. but if you pulled the money, um, that would allow integrated public institutions to atrophy. Um, and, and just the clawing back of power on, on, and, and, and the way that was helped by an exhausted post-Civil War majority of Americans uh, and, and really also, uh, I think, clicked into gear with an economic depression. So the way that all these forces are, are integrated. Um, and, and so it's just a reminder that there really does need to be vigilance. There needs to be as much historic perspective as possible. And, and when people start playing these old cards, they're hitting on deeper synaptic things in the American psyche than we're sometimes aware of, which is why understanding history is really important. Um, because, you know, you know, Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat, but sometimes it rhymes. Uh, if you can hear the rhyme, Mm. It'll impose some perspective on the debates of our time. So Chris, Lincoln famously says in his second inauguration speech, with malice toward none, with charity for all, in an, in an attempt to reconcile, uh, extend a hand to the, to the vanquished South. <clears throat> Clearly, Joe Biden wanted to be the uniter when he became president. What was his plan for bringing the country together? Well, Biden, for his first two, in it during his first two years, was really trying to do two contradictory things. I mean, one was to unify the country, and the other was to call out the threat to democracy represented by MAGA. The thing that shocked Joe Biden more than anything else as president was the staying power of Trumpism. Mm. He thought it would be in the rearview mirror by now. Uh, he thought. He, I won the election by seven million votes. I've got a mandate. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be able to move past this. Well, what he discovered was that he couldn't. And I think his instinct, you remember for the first year or so, he would only refer to the former guy. Mm. He didn't really talk, didn't even name Trump. As time went on, I, out of frustration, and I think vaccine resistance was mm. shocked him. He couldn't wrap his head around it. He kept calling Jeff Zients in, the coronavirus, uh, response coordinator who is now the chief of staff and saying, Jeff, what, you know, what, what's going on? He, he, could, he didn't get it. He couldn't wrap his head around that resistance. Mm. Um, so as time went on, I think Biden realized that Trumpism isn't going anywhere. Uh, he then gave that, I thought, what was then the best speech of his presidency in the anniversary of January 6th, right. which was a, just a really fiery speech yeah. in which he laid out the, the, the challenge. Um, and I think now he, he realizes, and I think, that, I think the Biden White House is planning uh, to run against Trump. I think they think Trump is gonna be the nominee. Mm -hmm. uh, he's weakened, he's wounded, but he is dangerous. 
And he still, for all of his legal woes and all the rest, he has a, a stranglehold on, on the base. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily see DeSantis running that gauntlet uh, without getting taken down. And I think um, a long-winded way of saying that I do think that the Biden White House believes that democracy is on the ballot in 2024. John, I want to ask you, you are a very well-respected pundit. What is your view of the Republican field and Donald Trump's prospects for 2024? Aside from the fact that I loathe the word pundit, uh, I appreciate the spirit of that question. <laughs> um, uh, look, I, I think that you know one one column I, I will write in the next week or two is sort of the you know you know uh, how Republicans can can stop Donald Trump's nomination with this one simple trick uh, is is the tempting headline. Um, the, the problem is, depending on how many people get in, and as far as I'm concerned, people should get in the race, but then it should winnow based on their you know, ability to garner support, fundraising and polling and otherwise. The, the problem is, is that Republicans have set up a situation where their primaries are winner take all. Um, and that means in an even relatively crowded field, Donald Trump is going to win. Now, Republicans know that he is deeply damaged uh, that um, he is kryptonite to independents and moderates, let alone, you know, Democrats and liberals. He splits the Demo Republican Party deeply. Um, but as we've seen in, in the politics around 24 and, and in the Dominion lawsuit, I mentioned this again simply because what we see is that there's a certain Stockholm syndrome. They're terrified of the base, and they're trying to figure out how to still navigate a lie, mm. which is un unacceptable. Uh, in my eyes. Now, look, I, I also think that there, I, I, you know, I'd be interested to know whether you think Biden is a slam dunk to run. Um, I understand the midterm elections, by the way, having an incumbent president below 50% approval, they lose an average of 46 seats. Mm -hmm. to, to have the kind of midterm performance, which really was independent voters rejecting election denialism, is unheard of. Uh, yeah. but, but, you know, I think Biden is betting it. it being Trump, and I don't think that's a, 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 a rematch the majority of the American people actually want to see, even if they think Biden's done a good job. Well, I think, you know, the polls have said, some of the polls have indicated that even Democrats, a plurality of Democrats, don't want Biden to run again. Mm. I, I, I think these polls are basically bogus. I think, and as, as Joe Biden likes to say, don't compare me to the almighty, yeah. compare me to the alternative. Right. <clears throat> if, if you rephrase that question and you put Biden up against Trump, mm. or, or if you were to say in, in the poll, uh, who has a better chance of beating Donald Trump, Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, you get very different answers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's a plan B for the Democrats. I, I don't think, I mean, there's been a lot of ink uh, lately advocating one of two things. Either Biden should step away mm -hmm. and just, you know, take the, Take the gold watch and the applause of a grateful nation, uh, and let somebody else carry the carry the baton, or alternatively, uh, a Democratic challenger should get in. Mm -hmm. I think neither option is viable for the Democrats. Uh, I don't think anybody thinks. I mean, if Biden were to step away, Kamala Harris is the immediate uh, front runner. And followed by I don't know that that's true. followed by a, 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 a food fight, followed by a, right. a real battle, but everybody would get it. Yeah, uh, which would be you know, uh, does anybody really want to want to bet on that against Donald Trump? Uh, number one, number two, I think a Democratic uh, a challenger again, a, you know, ask uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, well. Ask Jerry Ford um, how that went. Mm. Uh, so you know, a, a Democratic challenge also sinks their prospects. Mm -hmm. I think. So I, th I would say, compare them to the alternative. Right. Um, I, I want to come back to this subject in a, in a moment, but John, let me ask you: uh, Given the divisions in America, uh, which are the worst certainly in my lifetime. What role does the media play? You're our resident journalist here. Yep. You're on CNN. What role does the media play in fostering 
the polarization that seems endemic to America in the 21st <clears throat> century. So the rise of partisan media and the fragmentation of the media environment has been um, very bad for giving Americans the ability to reason together. Now, there's some technological innovations. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. I think it's pretty clear Fairness Doctrine had a, a, cohesing, a cohesing factor, if only because before the Fairness Doctrine was lifted in 1987, for example, um, what happened over is, is, is it, the, the most popular format on AM went from being music to talk radio, right-wing mm -hmm. talk radio overnight. Um, over time, what we have seen is, is, is the proliferation of, of partisan media, first on websites and talk radio, cable news, websites, blogs, social media. And that has moved uh, the power further and further to the extremes as the parties themselves become more polarized, in particularly the Republican Party. Um, and you see it, bring it up a third time, because it's a really big deal. <laughs> this isn't about competition between networks. Um, in, in the d discovery around the Dominion lawsuit, what you see is a lot of Fox execs and anchors freaked out that OAN and Newsmax were going to eat their lunch from a, uh, a viewer standpoint because they were more willing to parrot Donald Trump's lies. Mm -hmm. And truth was not the goal. As a matter of fact, there were calls to fire people inside the organization who were fact-checking Trump's lies. And that was all about fear of losing market share. So from a business standpoint, it's called cocooning, right? You play to a narrow but intense niche audience. And you do that through keeping them addicted to anger and anxiety. And that further moves our politics further and further to the extremes. Now, those of us who are in the center, and CNN is in the center, um, you, you, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Some are more effective than others, right? You can't do, you know, two people screaming side by side with each other. You need to have the ability to say, here are established facts, right? You need to deliver on the promise to make people smarter, not dumber, uh, and, and to offer some perspective. That is going to be less sexy structurally than playing to the base and keeping people addicted to anger and outrage. But our democracy depends on it. We need to put some guardrails around social media uh, in, in, in a constructive way, just so at least disinformation isn't amplified faster than facts, which it currently is. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, we've got a political problem that contributes to it as well. Um, but, you know, in, in the fullness of time, we'll see, I think, Donald Trump and the rise of social media in terms of the information that gets elevated being more conspiratorial, more confrontational. That's the perfect storm that got us where we are. Um, but we have to think much more structurally. And also remember that you vote with your eyeballs every day, not just your wallet. Uh, and, and, and what you pay attention to is what you'll get more of. You talked about guardrails. Can I though. just say it wouldn't hurt? Yeah, if, it wouldn't hurt at all if Dominion won big time. Right. <laughs> it's going to be very difficult to prove that the defamation I, I, claims. I, I but think it's tough, actual, but boy, they've got, it, it's a strong, strong case. Uh, no question no. about it. Yeah. Uh, but you talked about those guardrails, mm -hmm. right? Uh, some sort of regulations that you put in place. What is a quick win on curtailing misinformation and disinformation for? the purveyors of social media? Well, look, um, th this was one of my, you know, I, I had a couple of mission critical things, you know, to sort of, you know, <laughs> start healing the breach. Um, the, bi the big, like, baseline at the least you can do is this was the Electoral Count Act yeah. passing. That yeah. was a very big deal. Um, but, but algorithm <clears throat> reform had a lot of bipartisan support um, in the last Congress. Now you've got, of course, Republicans controlling the House. Um, but there was broad support. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean taking on Section 230, which is mildly technical. What you need to do is, is simply have more transparency around the algorithms that currently, um, I'll tell you a quick story. Facebook did an experiment. It's called Carol. They created a dummy account under the name Carol, and I think it was May of 2020. And Carol was theoretically a mother of three living in, uh, I think, Wilmington, North Carolina, and her interests were conservatism and Christianity. And the account didn't like anything, right? Didn't. It wasn't, you know, that which is theoretically supposed to have be at work. Within, within days, the account, according to Facebook's own internal auditors, was being inundated with extremist groups and conspiracy theories, mm. um, including QAnon. And, uh, and, and within weeks, they shut it down because, in their own words, it had become a cesspool of extremism. And, and the rise of QAnon during COVID was a symptom of this, which is almost like a test of, of you know, how quickly can something utterly insane be mainstreamed because people are going down rabbit holes. Um, that's what's being served up to people. That is, a, that is a human problem. That is a human created problem that partly preys on 
our instincts as human beings to slow down at car crashes and, and, and listen to the loudest voices. <clears throat> but we need to get our hands around that. There is the basis of some bipartisan support. The other thing is we need to invest in civic education again. Mm. Um, and those two things <clears throat> should be done and should be doable. Well, it, it would also help if we did not have a major political party that has opted out of the democratic process. Um, and a major network uh, that has become in effect, they're, they're Pravda. Right. Um, so, right. there's Could, that. Chris, let me, so, so in addition to writing the fight of his life, as, as Mark Lawrence mentioned, Chris has uh, written a book, a, a fabulous book on uh, the chiefs of staff uh, for our presence called The Gatekeepers, and he is really the expert on that, that crucial position in a White House. And you write in the book about this very revealing conversation, a Zoom call as it happens, yeah. between Ron Klain, the incoming Biden chief of staff, and 19 of his, of his 21 living predecessors. 22, 19 out of 22, 22 living White House chiefs were on this Zoom call with Ron Klain a month before the inauguration. Yeah. What is the substance of that call? Chris? So it's just fascinating to me because this is a, a tradition that goes back to Rahm Emanuel in 2008 when he was the new kid coming into the Obama White House as chief of staff and all the chiefs got together to, uh, as Dick Cheney put it, show him the keys to the men's room. Uh, and there have been no women, alas, uh, as White House chiefs of staff in history. Um, but, but I digress. So anyway, this, this call was fascinating because among other things, uh, LBJ's last chief of staff, Jim Jones, who was 82 years old at the time, uh, the first thing he said to, to Ron Klain was, you have got to take care of this president. You've got to make sure he gets his rest. I made sure that LBJ got a nap every afternoon. Um, I'm 82. I recognize this guy. I'm a champion at tripping going up the stairs. I, you know, he has the same gait that I do. Obviously, all of this goes to a big issue in the upcoming election, uh, namely Biden's age. Um, so it was a fascinating call, but everybody, everybody had a different piece of advice for Ron Klain. And Klain, um, you know, as it turns out, probably didn't need it because he, every living chief would tell you that nobody has ever been better prepared than Klain for that job. And after two years, he's, he's now out and has been replaced by Jeff Klein, uh, Jeff Zients. Uh, you can't do that job effectively for more than about 18 months. That's the average tenure. Uh, and Klain was wiped out, and, uh, but he leaves very large shoes to fill. I mean, I put him in the company of James A. Baker III, mm -hmm. Leon Panetta, mm -hmm. um, as one of the really effective White House chiefs. And, and you know, it, it, the other thing, with the exception of Klain, one of the things that's striking, not only by contrast with Trump, is the relative stability of Biden's administration. Um, you know, the, these are not as necessarily flashy people, but yeah. they seem to have a very high degree of collegiality in working uh -huh. together and advancing the boss's vision. And, uh, you know, with, with the exception of, I think, the disastrously executed withdrawal of Afghanistan, um, you know, I think, w which hurt Biden enormously with independent voters in particular, because I think it, it went against the, that promise of competence. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but I, I think you've seen, you know, that 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 promise largely uh, yeah, play so out. Yeah, I, so I really see um, the Biden presidency and, and my book as a kind of political thriller in three acts. Mm. And the first act was this unbelievably fraught transition that we've talked about. The second act was the first year of the Biden presidency in which you had the debacle of the Afghanistan evacuation. And I, and I write about that extensively and talk to Bill Burns, the CIA director, and uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, uh, Klain, um, and the others. And that really set off a, a steady decline in Biden's approval ratings. Uh, and the third act, I think, began on February 24, 2022, when mm. uh, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Biden rose to that moment, rallied NATO in a way that I don't think anybody else could have done. Mm. Uh, and uh, that there, thereafter, he was able to pass a string of legislative stuff, much of, much of it bipartisan, that, that rivals LBJ's legislative record. And then, as John mentioned earlier, uh, 
defied all the odds in the midterm elections. I want to come back to, to, to something you said about uh, Biden reviving NATO. You said he was in a unique position to do that. Why? Yeah. Why he spent was... his whole life it, it preparing for that kind of crisis. Yeah. This is a guy who spent uh, decades uh, you know, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, studying uh, NATO, champion, championing NATO, uh, these alliances, taking the measure of Vladimir Putin and Biden was clear eyed about Putin in a way that none of his predecessors were. Uh, you know, he, he understood that the only thing this guy understands, he didn't look into his eyes and see his soul. Right. Uh, he, he knew refused that- refused to say anything negative about him ever. He knew that Putin understood one thing only, and that is force. Mm. Uh, and so he was in a u unique position to, to rise to that challenge, I think. And, you know, I, th I like to think, I've said a lot of nice things about Joe Biden, but I, th I think my book is pretty clear eyed about what a disaster the, the Afghanistan evacuation was. Mm. And, um, and, and I, I think that that was a whole of government failure where everybody did almost everything wrong. Mm. But in the case of Ukraine, I think everybody did almost everything right. Mm. And I'll, you know, just tying two, two themes here together, um, I think one thing, Biden's always been a big believer in multilateral institutions, and yeah. so this is that moment. Um, and, and I keep waiting for, you know, Turkey's got to let in uh, Sweden and, and, and Finland, and when that happens, you know, or Norway, you know, th that's going to be a very big deal. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, I was really struck by an interview uh, that you had with President Biden where you're talking about what, what, what's, the, what's the game plan for Ukraine? And, and it's a text, it's a, it's a big paragraph mm -hmm. that is dense with detail um, about the weapon systems that need to go forward and what needs to be done. Well, javelins, and then we're going to need to sustain that, but the EU is going to need to really pick up a lot of the economic rebuilding. And it is, it is. Um, well, like Lincoln, he's got to not only win the war, but win the peace. Well, that's right. 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 No, no. He's, and he's already thinking about that and yeah. talking about it, but with really detailed weapon systems, you know, you know, you know, economic levers in a way that utterly cuts against the stereotype of him being someone who is in decline without a command of detail. Yeah. That, that, that paragraph jumped out at me. Yeah. Uh, and I've always thought he's better at town halls than people give him credit for. I think it's a strong, but, but that really made an impression on me because that, I mean, that's an incredibly, that's someone who understands government, policy, administration, weapon systems, economic aid, and is thinking about it comprehensively. But let me, let me so I, really it's, it's, maybe you just answered my question. I want to ask, ask you both this. It's amazing how much no. we miss when we examine our presence. They're perhaps the most scrutinized person on the planet Earth. And yet it astounds me when we look back at the administrations of our presence, how much we get wrong. So what are we getting wrong about Joe Biden in real time? Chris. Joe Biden, as, as I suggested before, has been underestimated time after time after time after time, uh, <clears throat> which is not to say that he didn't have a really rough ride for the first year of his presidency. He, he did for sure. Uh, and, you know, his, his competence, uh, the perception of his competence took a huge hit over Afghanistan. His approval ratings declined steadily. Uh, have ever since, with a little uptick recently. Um, so I, I think that um, what we what we tend to get wrong. I mean, <laughs> if you were to ask Joe Biden, Joe Biden would say you get everything wrong. Um, but what we tend to to miss is that these guys often uh, have a better better understanding of what they're doing than the press gives them credit for sometimes. Uh, I mean, the midterm election is a perfect example. Uh, and this, this was a case where they were, the Biden White House was mocked when they were talking about the threat to democracy, MAGA, and uh, women's reproductive rights. Mm. And everybody was saying, you guys are about to get shellacked. You're gonna get wiped out. People wanna hear about inflation. That's all they care about. Well. Uh, Biden and Ron Klain in particular had a very different mm. uh, take on what was required. And, and finally, uh, Klain actually sat Biden down and said, Mr. President, I know you want to go everywhere and talk about everything, 
but here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to the states where we know you're gonna make a positive difference, and you're gonna talk about reproductive rights and the threat of MAGA, and he followed that script, and the rest is history. So, um, to John's point, we know what we got it all wrong. The press right. got it all wrong. Right. Yeah, and and, and um, I mean uh, that really, I, I think that was you know I think someone had a good line. I think it was Tim Alberto, which is um, you know uh, vo voters uh, chose uh, you know normal over crazy. Right. Normal over crazy was yeah. that you, you quoted Barnacle saying that, that Barnacle, in your book. Yeah. But um, you know I, I think that was sort of the, the binary, and and it was the hardcore election deniers in swing states who all lost. That's a good thing for democracy, uh, putting, putting partisan politics aside. Um, you know, w the other thing is, I mean, the legislative record, which we, we have s touched on a little bit, um, is extraordinary and is what, in addition to Ukraine, I think you can say with a degree of confidence that he will be regarded as a consequential president. Mm. And to do that with a evenly divided Senate and a narrow divide in the House is almost unimaginably difficult, if not impossible. And I can tell you there are a lot of newsrooms that were incredibly cynical about the ability, uh, about his ability to get it done. And I think that's partly, you know, he doesn't have the physical vigor that we expect in mm. presidents. And, and, and he sometimes can be sort of a hidden hand with regard to his dealings with, uh, with, with Congress and the Senate. You did a great job talking about the, the mansion uh, back mm. and forth. But, you know, take a really big step back. How do we see Biden in history, which is in part, right? And you know, I, I looked at what that the C-SPAN grades its presidents, and I was incorporating this into a column. But it's kind of interesting to think about in that light. Public persuasion, crisis leadership, economic management, moral authority, international relations, administrative skills, relations with Congress, vision setting and agenda, pursuing equal justice for all. Now, you're not going to get all straight A's on that report card. But dealing with Congress, uh, moral authority, um, I, I think you know, international relations, administration with regard to, you, know, you start to see the outlines uh, of why I think there's a case to be made that a one-term Biden presidency would actually be you know, in, in, in the top quartile of, mm. of presidencies. Second terms tend to be dominated by disappointment. Mm. And I think there's actually a historic risk with that. But just judging by where we are now, looking at those <clears> categories, um, I think you can start to see how history might be, be inclined to view his administration favorably. Mm. But I think you could also say that for all the unbelievable challenges that he faced in the first two years, that now comes the hard part. Mm. Because none of this stuff makes any difference if you can't implement what you've done. I mean, the legislation, all the legislation means nothing until the rubber meets the road, and that means getting out there and, and implementing all of this stuff. That's, that's number one. I mean, he, he's 80, he'll be 82 years old running a bruising re-election battle. Uh, he's got to avoid a recession and, and bring inflation down. Uh, he's got to deal, you know, the border again is gonna be a club that the Republicans beat him with mm -hmm. uh, and, and try to bloody him with. Uh, and, and there's the unfinished job with NATO. I mean, I think, the legislation is a big deal, but I think, I think there are three defining tests for this presidency that the historians will be talking about. The first will be, what did he do about this once in a century pandemic, which he was elected to mm -hmm. wrestle to the ground? Number two, uh, what did he do when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine and threatened not just Ukraine, but Western democracy and raising the specter of nuclear war, which is the thing that keeps Biden up at night. And number three, I think it'll be how he faced down the threat to democracy represented by Trumpism and MAGA, which will still, which may well be on the ballot in 2024. I think those are the three big things. Let, let, let me let me offer a, a, a fourth um, because it's, it's that's not enough. Yeah, no, <laughs> but but it, because this is in some ways. Um, the background music to a lot of the challenges we're facing. And given the scale of the legislation that has passed, it, you know, he is, does as much as anybody to talk about rebuilding the middle class, mm -hmm. and, and, and in a way that's personal to him, right? And Andrew Sullivan had a great column called, uh, after the, the most recent State of the Union, called um, William Jefferson Biden. And what it was about is about uh, Biden triangulating with economic populism. Mm -hmm. 
and, and really reaching out and trying to rebuild the middle class and appeal to working class voters, many of whom fell under Trump's sway because they'd felt so screwed and squeezed for so long. And that part of the opportunity of what's in uh, the, the infrastructure bill, part of the opportunity of what's in the Inflation Adjustment Act, which could also help us deal with climate change, is an investment in America at home that could actually boost incomes. We're starting to see that in the lowest quartile, boost, strengthen the middle class um, in, in, a, in a way that actually makes us a more resilient society. That's not as sexy and headline grabbing as oh, the other three, right. no, but no, is. that is the background a to a lot actually, of yeah. what we, we are dealing with as a country. And we got to rebuild the middle class in this country. Otherwise, we're not going to have a middle of our politics. Yeah. Let me talk about, you talked about Kamala Harris a moment ago. Yeah. There's, a, there's a moment in your book that's very revealing. And a friend of Biden is asking how Kamala Harris is doing, asking Biden how Kamala right. is doing. Mm -hmm, right. And he said, she's a work in progress. Yeah. How does Joe Biden view Kamala Harris today? A continuing work in progress, a work still in progress. Um, they, the, that relationship is complicated and fascinating to me because they have a genuine bond. They certainly had it early in the, in the presidency. Biden wanted her in almost every, wanted her to be in almost every meeting, not just the president's daily brief in the morning, but almost every meeting. And he would look around and ask where she was if she wasn't there. Um, she was a real participant in, in these meetings and he valued her input. And then as time went on, things got a little dicier when she started taking so much uh, criticism for the, the Northern Triangle, that awkward trip to Guatemala she made, uh, the fumbled answer mm -hmm. to Lester Holt when he asked her why she hadn't been to the border. Yeah. Um, then. Biden got wind of the fact that the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, was going around complaining that she'd been given Mission Impossible, she'd been set up for failure, her portfolio was too difficult. Well, Biden, that really f pissed him off. Mm. Um, that was when he told, this, that's when this friend asked him, how's she doing, and he said, a work in progress. Mm. Um, having said that, he's given her a lot of really important national security assignments that she's carried out well. And, mm. and I tell this previously unreported story about how she met privately with Zelensky on the eve of the invasion at the Munich Security Conference. And, and uh, Zelensky was still skeptical that the invasion was on. And she told him, not only are they coming for Ukraine, mm. they are coming for you and your family and he was still a little bit skeptical and she turned to an aide as, as Zelensky left and said, I wonder if that's the last time we see him alive. Mm. Um, so, and, and she was back at the Munich Security Conference recently, as you know. So I think she's doing better, mm. um, but it, she's a work in progress, to be John, sure. We talked about how we get our presidents wrong, even though we scrutinize them uh, intensely. Uh, are we getting Kamala Harris wrong? How would you rate Kamala Harris right now as a vice president? Well, um, I mean, you know, Lyndon Johnson was underestimated by the Kennedys. And if you asked anybody before November 1963, they would say he's been, you know, a great Senate a majority leader uh, who will never amount to much. Um, and of course, you know, I think what's fascinating to see about the evolution of Lyndon Johnson's reputation is that Vietnam fades and his domestic accomplishments loom larger and larger and larger, particularly civil rights. Um, I think Kamala Harris has so far failed to convert on her promise in a pretty profound way. Mm. Um, now, if she were, uh, I'll say God forbid, uh, to suddenly become president, you would see a very different assessment simply, I think, given the nature of the responsibilities. Um, but uh, while you know, vice presidents are rarely given great and easy assignments, this is true. The, the promise and the premise of Biden-Harris was handing the torch over to the next generation. Mm. It was an inverse of the Obama-Biden relationship in, in some ways. Um, and, and, you know, that promise has not converted <clears throat> to the respect of her peers or, or the American people in a broad enough way yet. To me, the most troubling sign, and this isn't as a journalist, this is just as a, you know, if, if you see high, high turnover of staff, I don't care if it's a private business, you know, organization, that's not a good sign. 
and, and, and she has very high turnover in her team. Mm -hmm. um, and so that needs to get stabilized. Um, I think she's a very compelling political figure in many respects. Um, but I do not think, if Biden were to step aside, that she would be the prohibitive favorite to be the nominee. Well, she'd start out that way, and, th and then everybody would get it yeah. for a week or two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris, and I, I, I want her to succeed, as we should all want our presidents or vice presidents to succeed, putting partisan politics aside. Chris, what is Biden's thinking process looks like, look like as he determines whether he'll throw his hat in the ring in 2024? He's going. He's running. Without um, question. I, it, well, I, in my mind, yeah. I mean, 99%. The only person who could possibly talk him out of it would be his most influential advisor, Dr. Jill Biden. She, but there's no indication that she's anything but on board. I mean, she's, so I think, I think he's running. Um, Biden has spent every, he spent every four years of his life either running for president or dreaming about running for president, mm -hmm. wanting to be president. Uh, presidents do not give up power for the most part, voluntarily. The last one who did was Lyndon Johnson in 1968 when he walked away. Um, George W. Bush's first chief, Andy Card, once said to me, you know, Chris, if anybody tells you they're leaving the White House voluntarily, they're probably lying to you. So, you know, Biden has the ego and the ambition that every, all of his predecessors had, but, but I think he also feels Again, that he has unfinished business. And I think the stakes arguably could not be higher mm. when it comes to Ukraine and uh, you know, the stability of, of democracy in Western Europe and, and all the rest. Because you know, I spent a lot of time talking to Bill Burns, the CIA director, about mm. Vladimir Putin. Burns feels that it's existential for conquering Ukraine Ukraine is existential. He doesn't think that... Um, it's existential for Putin. For Putin. For fact, he right. doesn't think that Putin will, uh, will settle for anything less. Mm. That, that even, even a temporary uh, freeze or agreement would, would just be breathing room before he went back for the rest of Ukraine. That's, that's Burns' view. Mm -hmm. I think that um, as much as conquering Ukraine is existential for Putin, I think defeating him is existential for Western Europe and for uh, democracy. Mm. I mean, I think, it's, uh, I think it's that black and white. Um, so that's just a personal opinion, but I think Biden feels that way. Do, I wonder, do you feel that, um, we, we know that politically Biden uh, feels that if Trump's gonna be the nominee, he's the guy you know, who has to vanquish him one last time, that their, yeah. their fates seemed <clears throat> entwined. Yeah. Um, but he'd that, be running anyway, anyway. Yeah, but, that, but that, that logic might not apply if someone other than Donald Trump is, is the Republican nominee. Right. That's the first line of his obituary, right? He wrested the presidency from Donald Trump, right. without question. Right, right. sure. And, 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 but I, but I, I guess, you know, what you're saying is, until Putin and Trump are off the stage, Biden will feel that his leadership is indispensable. Well, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I don't know that he would say his indispensable is probably yeah, too egotistical. Yeah, but yeah, that, but, that I, he, but I think he needs to. He needs I to think remain. he would be running even if Trump were out of the picture. I think even if he thought hmm. DeSantis was the uh, favorite, Biden would be running. Biden hmm. is running, uh, and it doesn't matter who the opponent is. I think he feels he has unfinished business. Let me go from the 46th president back to the 16th president as we cap off this conversation, John, and ask you, what can we learn from Abraham Lincoln at this moment in our history? Uh, I, I think first just returning to, just remembering that basic thing, which is that character is the single most important quality in a president. Um, I would go as far to say that someone's politics, their policies, their partisan affiliation, doesn't matter much compared to the question of whether they have fundamentally good character. Um, and, and that means caring about people, right? I mean, you know, Lincoln is a particularly vivid example of, of that kindness can be consistent with effective leadership, but I've always was struck by something that, that General Sherman said, um, looking back on their last meeting, said, you know, of, of, of all the 
all the great men I ever met, he was the one who was the most, had the most goodness. And of all the good men I ever met, he was the greatest. And that the key there is that Lincoln's greatness actually comes from his goodness. Um, and I think that's something where, you know, Biden's well-deserved reputation for personal decency, not perfection, but, but stands him well. I also think the thing that Lincoln it challenges us, we need to be honest about the fact that our empathy has been strained. It's difficult when we're having political debates and people are not dealing with facts, facts that go to the heart of our democracy, disinformation that goes to the heart of their willingness to you know, die of a disease to own the libs in some cases. But empathy is essential in a democracy. <clears throat> And, and you know, we, need to, we need to get back to that place where you know, there is an assumption of goodwill. Lincoln helps us in that regard also because for a president um, in the middle of a civil war who people want to kill, um, who in private and public is constantly reaching out, who retains his ability to believe that there's more than unites us than divides us as Americans, and to really believe it, not just say it, to show it in private. Um, that's the kind of leadership I think we need. Humor helps, honesty helps, balancing moral courage with moderation helps, but it's that marrow deep belief that there's more that unites us than divides us and showing it in our own lives as citizens, not simply waiting for a president to set that example. That, that's how Lincoln, I think, can help all of us out of this. I'm so sorry that Emily Ramshaw couldn't be here today, but I've had a blast <laughs> talking to these two wonderful minds. Thanks to Chris Whipple and John Avalon. And thank you all for coming out. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Thanks, buddy. Well done. Great. I really enjoyed it. Chris, what a delight. Thanks.